because I had sex with him in the raw. I'm not HIV positive. So that kind of, why well, I didn't get a pick. A lot of my friends got it, and I was the only one in the group. So that kind of baffled me. You can have sex with somebody and still don't become positive. I didn't do nothing wrong. Not like I'm wishing it upon me, but that's what affected my life, and I had to keep this a secret about my mate who had HIV. So, I'm honored. I feel bad. A lot of my girlfriends suffered. Because it was called GRID. When it first came out, it happened in, in, in Los Angeles, I believe. And it all of a sudden grew out to be something big. Thank God for they got prepped today. So, I hope a cure comes along. But who's ever suffering it? I was a buddy from Gay Men Health Crisis, and I've seen what AIDS have done. But in our community today, we are more knowledgeable about HIV, and the gay community is on the lead of being safe. Me and Chloe went on to the village and gave out condoms. I know Miss Sky remember how we used to go into the village to give out condoms when we was at Positive Health Project. When Chloe used to be at the meetings telling us about her band and things, how we used to pack up the condoms over there on 8th Avenue before my shade took over. So it took a lot of our friends and our dear loved ones. So it has affected us all in some type of way. I'm just honored for those, my girlfriends that are not here to see what's going on with the prep, the Truvada, the pep. Now you can take a pill and it helps. So, I thank God for Sylvia Rivera. They got condos upstairs. Anytime you want to go there, you can always find somebody who's giving out condoms. So those, don't feel bad. Just keep rallying and protesting and handing out condoms. Be kind to one another. Because you, know, you don't know who you're hurting or saying derogatory things about HIV. It could be you next. <laughs> so I'm going to give this back to Marina. I don't want to just hold y'all up. But AIDS was a terrible disease that affected all of us in the AIDS. Those that used street drugs were scared because we didn't know we was going to come down with this dreadful virus. So, it has infected me a lot. <coughs> and I wouldn't take an AIDS test until 2014 because I was scared that I was positive. And when the doctor told me in Calalor I wasn't positive, I was like, what? And I was worrying all this time because I did have a partner that was HIV positive. So, get out there, get, get tested. Better to know than don't know. So that's what I'm promoting. Y'all get tested. Don't be like me, not get tested. Because you're only saving your life and others. And please use condoms. Um, in the 80s, there certainly wasn't LGBT or Q. Um, People didn't even say lesbians and gays, or gays and lesbians. There was the lesbian world, and there was the gay community, and that was that. And then AIDS hit, and we circled the wagons, and it became lesbians and gays. Um, 
trance was always on the outside of that, and we all know B is a phase, so <laughs> they never, never got included. Um, queer was a bad word, uh, like tranny is today. Um, so we did start coming together over that terrible crisis. How it affected the trans world is a whole generation of trans people died. Queens, they left, they're, they're gone. Um, dear friends left. Uh, and the overlap between the drag performances and queer theater. I was working in theater rhinoceros and at Josie's Cabaret and Juice Joint in San Francisco. Uh, Donald Montwell lived with AIDS and was producing queer theater until the day he died. Well, not until the day he died. He had a hard time of it. Um, theater Rhinoceros lost staff by the week. Um, and a lot of our lives as performers or entertainers in some way, there was always, uh, we were always given up like a couple of nights a week to raise money for this or raise money for that. Uh, I'm glad we did. I think that's important and, and I hope that tradition continues. Um, we've risen from the ashes and we are LGBTQ. B is still a phase, but we still put a give it all that. Um, I would like to see bisexuality get some sort of recognition. It's been a long time and they haven't. Um, there was no, nothing like that in, during the AIDS epidemic. Bisexuals were people who refused to come out. That's how we saw people who were bisexual. And, and there was no respect. So I know that trans has its moment in the sun right now. Maybe bi will have its moment in the sun very, very soon. Okay, um, I think the hard thing about that was people were getting diagnosed on Monday and dying by Friday. And for a generation of, say, you age, your age of people, that was a hard thing to have to deal with. You didn't want to meet anybody because you didn't know if you wanted to see them next week. If you didn't see somebody for a couple of days, you automatically knew they had passed away. You know, and that kind of thing usually doesn't happen to people till they're around my age that you're going to start dying, all of them. You know, so the rough part was at that time for people in their 20s and early 30s were dying, and it was affecting how you socialized, where you went. The clubs all of a sudden were fucking empty. Nobody was out. Nobody wanted to drink. Nobody wanted to meet anybody. It was a period in time to whereby we completely saw folks isolate themselves and shut them off from other people out of the fear of knowing them, you could get it. Shaking their hand, oh, you're next, you know. Luckily, if you survive through that, I know girls now that have had this thing 25, 30 years. Thank God they're still here, you know, and that they're hanging on and that the medicines are better. Uh, better doesn't mean where it should be. It just means better. And for right now, they still need the support of friends and family. They still need people out there who will help them get through the rough patches to get to a smooth patch. That's what it's done. Uh, I come from a different... I, I wasn't enmeshed into the queer world back then. You know, I was living in a box up in the 30s uh, on 7th and 6th Avenue. In between 42nd and 32nd Street, you could usually find me on a box, in a box on 7th Avenue. Uh, the first time that I think we ever heard about Grit uh, was, you ever hear of a movie called uh, Dog Day Afternoon? Mm -hmm. Right? Starring Dustin Hoffman. Right? So he was trying to rob a bank to get money for his trans girlfriend. 
right? So this girlfriend we knew, right? This trans woman, uh, and periodically stay at this hotel, and she'd go around knocking on the doors constantly, asking for money for this new disease that was out, you know? And we had not a fucking clue what it was, you know? We were all heroin users, you know? When we weren't in a hotel room, we could get our money together. It was like $9 a night or something like that. Uh, it was living in boxes or in the train stations. We all shot heroin. We all used the same fucking needles. You know, I seen all of them die. I don't know how it fucking skipped me. I used the same shit as them. You know, we didn't clean things. There was no needle exchange. There was nothing like that. Uh, so it's a different experience. Uh, you know, you know, when you're homeless, you're, you're just trying to survive. You know, even though you know that there's some things going around. You know, it's not really in the forefront. You know, it's like where you're gonna get your heroin, where you're gonna sleep that night, and. How are you going to survive not being killed or raped or beat up? You know. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I guess this is kind of a follow-up question, which is, even though um, trans people are having a lot of visibility right now, so many of the issues that everyone on this panel has talked about are part of that moment of visibility. Um, and I'm specifically thinking about homelessness as it um, affects all of us, right? And whether we've um, personally been homeless or our community and friends have been. I'm curious about if you, what your thoughts are around making sure that homeless communities continue to be centered within trans communities. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> This is my thing. Being homeless and being trans or being uh, gender non-conforming, you're fucked. You're just screwed out there, you know. Uh, being trans in a homeless shelter, all my work is done in the New York City shelter system today, right? Under Jay's house. Uh, and the trans women that come to our groups, all, all, all across the board, it's the same complaints about the shelters. Call the wrong names, the wrong pronouns. Can't get clothes because it's a woman's shelter and they don't have clothes that fit, you know, uh, which I'm trying to rectify. Uh, it's, it's, you know, the residents and the staff themselves, you know, that it's so bad in there to, for being trans, you know, and uh, a friend of mine, uh, you know, a trans woman was in the New Providence Women's Shelter here on 45th Street, and uh, she's Asian, and she made a comment saying how easy it was for her, being a, a Chinese, being a trans woman, and watching her other trans girls that were in there, uh, African American, and Latinas being treated completely another way, you know? Uh, and that's how she felt, and that's how she saw it, you know? And I see it the same way, walking through these doors with the shelter systems, you know? Uh, the Department of Homeless Services does not do enough, you know? I try to, when I meet with the shelter directors, to try to inform them around uh, trans issues by bringing in Sylvia Rivera Law Partner, ALP, FIERCE, as many organizations that I, that I can to bring into the shelter system, uh, because it's bad, you know, it's bad for Butch. You know, when I first entered the shelter system, staff threw me down a flight of stairs, they jacked me up in a fucking bathroom, you know, and people don't enter the shelter system because they hear, you know, we talk, homeless people talk, <laughs> you know? And it was like, don't go into the shelter system because it's dangerous. You know, and it is, you know, I gotta say, it's still dangerous, you know, uh, for trans and uh, uh, gay men in the men's shelters. The men's shelters are the worst. Uh, and show, to, even today we had this conversation around shelter directors blaming, you know, a trans woman will get into a fight with a cis woman, right? And the director will tell me, well, it's because she's fucking trans. And it's like, no, it's not. 
It's because there's 235 women in this small building, right? And it's hot, and you have no air conditioners. And maybe somebody sat on a bed, or maybe somebody picked up a piece of personal up there. That's why the fights are. It's not, has nothing to do with trans, but that's how they think. It has to, everything is because they're trans. It has to be because they're trans. And we need to stop that whole culture around how the, the city thinks about these issues, you know? Or get our own shelter, you know? That's what I'm about. <laughs> yes, yes. So, okay, I'm gonna, a word of hope. Um, on Pride, I got to hang out with Caitlyn Jenner. And I happen to know she's taking homeless trans very seriously. She's taking trans sex work very seriously. And she, only she intends to use her celebrity to, make, to bring these issues to the front. So let's see what happens. I think at this point, because there's uh, so many brilliant folks in the audience, we're going to do Q and A for the remaining amount of time. Um, so, do we have questions for our <laughs> brilliant panelists? Come on, those burning questions you wanted to ask your elders. Ask them. Come on, get shot. Ah. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, my name is Jim Forad, and I'm an elder. I'm 74. And I want to thank each of you, particularly Miss Majors, who I've never seen before. And I'm so deeply moved. It's important that the young people understand that people our age did not have access to things that people have today. And that if we have Social Security, it is very, very low. And we don't like to talk about money and how we survive. I live on less than $1,000 a month in New York City. I've got every benefit that I can find, but it's hard, and people need to understand that we who came before them and created a world that they have today, which has a lot more opportunity, need to be taken care of, not infantilized, not infantilized. Ask us what we need, ask us what you'd like to know about our lives. We love you all of you, good, bad, whether I agree with you or not, right. you are our children and our grandchildren. But understand that for most of us, we're not Caitlyn Jenner. We don't have money, regardless of our color. We're poor for the most part. We worry about where we have to live. We worry about the kind of food that we eat. And a lot of the senior centers are not sensitive to who we are. Well, my name is Brooke Serda, and um, you know, I I still hear those stories that that uh, over here right now in 2015. So I uh, I don't see a lot of change, you know, when it comes down to um, like I I heard this story so many times at Hasa, which is the uh, institution who, who puts the um, managed HIV, you know, stuff. They always target uh, black trans women. They start in the transition and put them in the worst neighborhoods in the Bronx with no hope of, uh, of switching to another neighborhood. And, it, and it, is, it is so frustrating that nobody is doing anything about it. You know, that, you know that's a class action lawsuit. You know, if you, can, if you gather all, all, these, all these women together, and they all have the same conditions, you know, holes in the walls, uh, roach infestation, rats, and the neighbors threatened to kill them, you know, every other day. And, and it's just like, I really don't see, um, you know, the progress. I see uh, yeah, that is very bittersweet. Um, we're getting our birth certificates aligned if you were born in this state. Um, you're getting uh, gender markers aligned and names aligned. Uh, all these great things, but still, life expectancy is only 35, 38 for trans women of color. 
And when I say trans women of color, I'm talking, you know, m you know, statistically, mostly of African descent. You know, this country has a big issue with uh, skin color, and that makes a big target. And, <clears throat> and we are women. We stand at that intersection. And our transness, you know, that combination, it, it's lethal, statistically speaking. We lost 113 women last year in Brazil from our community alone. Is anybody talking about it? You know, um, there's a big language barrier. I'm trying to reach out to the activists uh, over there, people to connect me and see how can I do something. You know, I, I, it has to be their voice, you know, not whatever they decide. But it is really dire. It's a state of emergency for trans women of color. You know, and, and I just see that, you know, I go to the groups. Uh, I used to go three, four times a week. Uh, I'm taking a little hiatus right now. And always the same st stories of hopelessness and despair. Uh, you know, it's just like, they they just, and, and I see the, the newer generations, they don't have the, the coping skills and the thick skin that, that we have, you know, and, and they got a very short fuse. You know, that they just they just want to quit right away, and they talk really scary. It scares me so much, and you know, I don't think it's any time to to slow down with our you know with our activism. You know, this is a time to really speed it up because people are starting to get fed up already of us. They think it's like we're always having headlines and stuff. But where is our civil rights? Where is where where are protections? Where is where is, they don't see that? You know, people have hijack or or narratives, and uh, people that already think it's like, oh my God, you know, you are a media horse. You know, you're always in the media. I was like, yeah, but this is not the people who who should be in the media. It's not the people who who who's going to benefit from it. it people are benefiting careers, not communities. And it's so disgusting and it's so depressing and you know, I mean I cry like every other day, you know, from this hopelessness. Um, and, and, and I know it, it's self-care, as I hear this, it is, it is so necessary and it is so part of, uh, of who we are. You know, so I'm taking that, you know, and you know, I'm gonna put it on, on post-its all over my house because I really need to laugh and have fun Otherwise, I'm gonna burn down like so many activists have. So yeah, I just wanted to make that comment. I'm sorry, I realize it's not a question. <laughs> Anybody who no wants to piggyback, I don't know. Yeah. 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 You know, the sad thing about this is, is that yes, this has been going on for years, and it, the society happens to think that. Look, Vern Cox and Annette Mark are the very first ones of us. Forgetting that we've been here ever since time began. Uh, but that's obviously why Cain killed Abel. The bitch wore her shoes and the motherfucker got upset. You must die. <laughs> you know? And it's a matter of realizing who we are. You know, if I was Caitlyn Jenner and I had a hundred million dollars, you bet I would have come out looking like the world's first Christine Jurgensen of fall. <laughs> It's a matter of making sure that we take care of one another, you know, because yes, they're popular, but I feel that their visibility has affected the girls who have to work the streets to survive. That's the girls that are struggling to make it, the girls who don't know what's going to happen to them tomorrow. Because you can't get to them, Caitlin and Dan, you can't reach them, but you can reach the girls that are out there in the street every day, you know, uh, so you can see them and run over and kick their ass. You know what I mean? And it's all okay, because society's going to turn a blind eye, you know. And it's sad, because say six boys jump on some girl, so then suppose she was in a ring and she kicks their ass. When the police come, she goes to jail, and they go home. That's bullshit. You know, they need to wake up, realize what the hell is going on, and stop these motherfuckers from abusing us like it's open season. There's no open season on me. And if there is, I have mace now, and I have 38 snub nose guns. I'm not taking this bullshit any fucking more. I'm not going down the other side. Thank you. Right, right, right. Here you go. Thank you. Right. I have a question. Sure. Um, well, my question uh, is a lot of, we've been talking about, sorry, 
choked on my turn. Uh, really make it brilliant. <laughs> uh, we've been talking about, and I've been really listening to, feel the a sense of like, I've lost so many people and I'm still here. I'm wondering if um, you wanted, you know, we brought in a, a few people's names, Chloe, and we talked about Sylvia. If there are other people that um, you want to mention and say, like, you know, talk about as a person who helped you get to this place today or supported you, um, just to bring in those names, because so often uh, the names of people, you know, like you're saying, Jay, like, people know about us but don't necessarily know about the other people. So if you had, if you wanted to mention any I'd like to mention one of my girlfriends who helped me when I was transitioned at a younger age in Philadelphia. Her name is Lisa in the North Philadelphia. And when I didn't have a place to stay, Lisa took me in. She gave me a place to stay while my sister threw me out of the house because I wanted to be who I was. So I could walk. I wish she was here. So she could see me sitting up here today. Lisa died. We lived together in Philadelphia and I brought her to New York. And she went with the wrong crowd. But she's dead. Lisa, I'm still there. I mentioned her earlier, but and Doris Fish, yes. my drag mom, uh, taught me fierce. I, I was a shy thing, I was a scared thing, and she taught me fierce. She and her pal, Miss Tippy, both of them died of HIV. Lou Sullivan, who pioneered, who brought female to male, out of one of the darkest, dirtiest closets there's ever been. And on top of that, he was a gay man. Passed. And not many people know about him anymore. I would like to see more people talking about him. That would be helpful and sweet. Okay, the list is endless. So let's just say to all the souls that are out there that left here that I knew, passed on the street, had a drink with, need to come back. You know, we need to feel their presence, you know what they went through before they left here. And for me, it's like, you know, wherever they are, let's go with them in heaven, and they're having all the sex they can ever possibly handle. <laughs> <laughs> well, someone that's still here. I was 13. <laughs> and this major took care of me as a young and homeless and everything. She showed me the ins and outs of uh, the West Village and, and I'm thank you for that. Uh, and again, as Major said, is the I fucking list is very long. Only Mona. I don't know why we called her only Mona, you know. Beaten, tortured and hung up on the rafters in the Bowery in the late sixties for being a queer woman. Debbie, heroin addict, dear heart, died of HIV. Myron Myron, Myron William, uh, a dear friend also from HIV. Uh, there's just, I guess we're the only ones left from them from those days. I can see their faces, you know. All of the homeless people that lived underneath the World Trade Center that I've spoken to and heard their fucking stories that are gone now. <sighs> yeah, just too many names, too many faces, too many fucking stories. Could, I add, three, could I add three names to that? Um, I want to add three names. One of them is anonymous. It's the passing woman, which was the term that was used to describe a bull dyke, a very masculine looking woman. Uh, the passing woman was the positive term at the time. We actually ignited the situation in front of the Stonewall Inn in 1969 and is lost in most of the histories that you hear. Talk about Marty Steffens. 
Jay, did you know Marty Stephens? You know, I don't know, I knew a few Martys. <laughs> Marty Stephens was, a, was another passing woman who the most important event in her life. She stop yes. When wow. she, she came into the Gay Liberation Front and she announced, a he, Marty, announced that the most important event in Marty's life is when they gave Marty the key to the men's room in the building that Marty worked in and as a janitor, not knowing what her, sexual, what her sex was. And, and Marty represented all those non-conforming gender people at the very beginning of this movement and wrote a, a, an article in the original Gay Liberation Front newspaper called Stepping, Fetching, Women. And I hope that all of you in the, that are here today will find that article and read it because she, he, Marty was there. And Mark Giles, who was a platinum blonde butch with a ducktail hairdo that was a bartender at Paula's on 7th Avenue South, who died of cancer about six years ago. But she was another non-political person who came into the Gay Liberation Front and represented not the whitewashing of the Stonewall, the whitewashing of that beginning of the movement. We had poor people, we had, we had all kinds of gender expression, and that story and those people's names have to be remembered. seems to be this gulf that is creating a further separation in some ways when we are talking about things like technology and how our elders are actually ending up getting aged out and pushed out of, of work and especially in the not-for-profits. It's a really big issue and so when we're talking about things like money and making a living, it seems to me like our elders are some of the most important assets for organizing, and yet there's a lot of ways in which I feel like I'm watching, watching you guys get pushed back and pushed away. Even when we talk about marriage, no matter what your feeling is on it, when you, if, if you're coming up as, in a generation where something like marriage is possible, you have a completely different kind of family network. Whereas when you're aging and the idea of marriage isn't even remotely possible, it's a very different kind of experience. And so we have these different things that are happening that are identified and labeled as progress, but how they are used can be used in many different ways. And it seems to me, from my perspective, like in some ways, these things that are identified as progress are, we are also using to push out our queer elders. And, and it's really concerning to me, and I'm, I'm wondering if anybody would be willing to share about your experiences with that. Well, I've done the marriage thing. <laughs> I have done the marriage thing. But I didn't do it under the, the uh, under the umbrella of gay marriage. I've done it. I don't want to do it today because I'm getting ready to adopt. I finished the math classes down on uh, 13th Street in the center. So, before I go, I wanted to adopt a transgender child that needs a home. I did the man thing. And um, I'm glad those that want to get married, I'm happy for you, but I'm not interested in marriage at this age. I've done it. So, I don't feel bad about it, but I support it. For those who want to be married, I get 100% for it. But now I need to do me. Sometimes we miss out on doing things for ourselves. So getting a child, a transgender child, is what I'm looking to do in the future. So thank you. Aging out, if you will, of the workplace. Um, we have different abilities at this age. Uh, and the abilities are not valued in consumerist culture. Um, mostly 
we can provide context, we can provide history, so that people can avoid making the same mistakes. These are not valued in corporate America. And I think it wouldn't be necessarily training elders to get with it and go into competition with people who are younger. It would be finding out, okay, what skills do you have? What skills have you developed now that you're 70? How can we use those skills in our workplace? Those would be the questions nobody knows how to ask yet. homeless living in a box and I so remember this because I tell this story a lot because it, it just hit me in the face. Homeless and there's a, you know there's groups of homeless people out there you know that we stick together you know and we take care of each other. So we're all on 32nd Street between 6th and 7th Avenue across the street from the little park and this was I don't know maybe in the 80s and we've seen all these people walking around talking to them for themselves, you know? And we were only a few blocks from Bellevue. And we all thought that everybody, that they met a mass amount of crazy people, I just used that expression, but that's what it was back then, out of Bellevue Hospital. And they were all walking around in our neighborhood, you know? Because everybody was like, and talk, until somebody finally, you know, caught on that there was these things called cell phones. <laughs> you know? it was like, but it was like crazy, you know? Uh, technology, you know, the, those tweety things. I have a tweet account, right? Not Twitter account, Twitter. Twitter. <laughs> tweet. <laughs> Not like whoopee, but a twat. <laughs> a tweet. Uh, tw Twitter. <laughs> Uh, so I have an account, don't know how to get in it, somebody set it up for me, and, and I don't not actually know how to get in it. I'm pretty good on Facebook. Uh, you know, I still think I think pretty well, you know, I think I'm still a good organizer, and uh, can manage stuff. Uh, I do see elders pushed out of the workforce in the grassroots organizing. You know, uh, because you know, young, young guys are coming up. You know, but there, you know, there has to be a place for elders also. You know, that we can't just be put out the pasture. Uh, that we, you know, I think I have something important to give you guys. You know, even if it's just the story of the past, of where how you how you got to where you are now, is because we walk those roads ahead of you. You know. Uh, I forgot what I was saying. Anyway, I'll pass it on now. <laughs> That's because you're old. <laughs> so we have time for, yeah, for one last question. Hello. Yeah. First, I want to say uh, how appreciative I am of you all being here um, as our elders. Um, you're invaluable. There's no way that what you have, in terms of your experience, what you've lived through, what you've survived, and what you continue to live with, can ever be replaced by anything material. It's a completely spiritual uh, trend, um, exchange that would go on in terms of your wisdom. And for that, we should all be so grateful. And, and I, I am so humbled by your presence here. In the African and Native American tradition, and in all traditions of every culture, the remembrance of one's ancestors and the older people in the community are the bedrock yes. of our own experience. Yes. A people that forgets their old people forget their own selves. We will forget ourselves if we forget you. So we will not forget you. That's right. <laughs> and there's no way. There's no way that you could be forgotten because 
We are you. You are us. We are each other. As we all come to consciousness and we begin to remember ourselves and understand that this culture that we currently live in, this capitalist, this consumer culture, which dumbs us down into believing that we could be um, somehow extradited from the experience of growing older, from being without material substance. All anybody has to do is pull a plug and it's all off. All our cell phones, all of our electricity, and then we're back to relating to each other as human beings. So if we don't remember, if we don't practice now, if we don't practice now why we have the chance with each other to bring our humanity up, which you remind us of because you had to live through it when you didn't even have the privileges that we have now. Right. Right. So you had to go through the guttural experience. And guess what? It's still like that. We live in the United States of America. Most people, trans people living outside of this country and in different parts of the country are still going through horrific, um, inhuman um, situations just to survive every day. So it's not the past. It's not back then. That's it's right. still right now. That's right. There's still lots of uh, young people on the street without any places to go. I know what it's like to be discarded from. I was a, I am a trans man, and I did live, and I was, extra, you know, uh, kicked out of my family at a very early age. If it wasn't for the fact that I was an artist and that I had a creative uh, something to focus on, I could have easily just like, I mean, I was out there anyway, you know what I'm saying? I was really on my own and without 